Thank you so much for coming out tonight before Rosh Hashanah. We know it's a very busy time, and it's a tremendous chus that we have tonight, Rabbi Lowy, the Maradasra of the Aguda, and Rabbi Ephraim Elio Shapiro, the Maradasra in North Miami Beach. And this event tonight is presented by Project Inspire. As many of you are aware, Project Inspire came on the scene about eight years ago and has been a trailblazer in promoting achdos and caring about Klal Yisrael for everybody. That uh, Baruch Hashem in Toronto, when we talk about achdos and Klal Yisrael, you just look at your neighbor on your right and the left, and oftentimes we don't have to go beyond that. I feel like when Project Inspire does their events in Brooklyn, so people need detectives to go find people who don't look exactly like them. Baruch Hashem over here, we have many opportunities. And that's really the reason why we decided to sponsor this event tonight is because we have Rosh Hashanah coming up and Sukkot, and then we have Parsha Slech Lecha, the Shabbos project. So it's an incredible opportunity to really reach out, to think beyond what we're doing today and think about who we could affect tomorrow. So that's uh, from the project Inspire. I'd like to introduce now Mr. Stuart Heitman. Mr. Heitman has really been the driving force behind Project Inspire International. And he's a tremendous, tremendous Oscan in this community, very involved with many Meistasim. And it's my pleasure to call upon Mr. Heitman to address us. I want to welcome everyone tonight to this very important evening um, in terms of what we want to accomplish for Project Inspire in Toronto. You know, for me personally, it is a tremendous bracha to be involved with an organization like Project Inspire. And tonight I just want to tell you, I want to communicate to you just two really short messages. Now, the first one. As good as the Kirov organizations are out there, as great a job as they do, they need the from community to accomplish their goal in a complete way. We have to understand this. They just don't, they do great work. They're Merkara Vyedin, they bring them closer to Torah. They, they don't have the manpower that the Frum community is. They need us and we have to understand that we are required for them to have their ultimate success in their, in their job. And that's what some of the things that we're trying to accomplish here with Project Inspire. We have, as we had, Rabbi Leib Irons, who works for NCSY and Torah High, and we brought him on with Project Inspire as well. And one of our strategies is to network between the care of organizations and the firm community and create those relationships. That's a key strategy of what we're trying to accomplish. They have all the database, they have the people who they're working with, and we, have, we are the manpower, and we have to understand they need us. We have, an, we have an essential and a critical role to play here. That's the first point. The second point I want to make is, if you ask any Baal Tshuva on, when they were on their pathway to become Frum, ask them, did they have a Frum person who was their anchor, who was their person that they would go to for questions, who was their person they leaned on when they needed something, who they went to for Shabbos most of the times? Do me a favor, do this survey. Ask around any Baal Tshuva, and they will tell you all the same answer. They all had that one from person, that one from family that was their anchor in their pathway to Yiddishkeit, to Torah and Mitzvahs. So, ladies and gentlemen, do you understand what I'm saying here? There is no Baal Tshuva out there who does not have a person like this. That means that each one of us, if we have a uh, two, three hundred people here today, three hundred people go out of this evening and commit, I am going to be the anchor for another Yid out there, that's three hundred from Yidin. That's three hundred Balei Tshuva. 
You don't have to be the one. Of course, they're going to go to other rabbin. They're going to go to care of organizations. They're going to go to different people as well. But you can be that one rung on their ladder. You can be that anchor for them. And you should understand that that is critical. Every, every Baal Tshuva has had a relationship like that. Ask them. I'm sure there's some Baal Tshuva here tonight. Ask them tonight. If you know one, ask them. If I had one. Ask them anyone. So you should gain, you should take that, get physic from it, and know that you can make a difference. You can have that impact. If everyone comes out of tonight, and we're going to tell you a few things that we're planning for the coming year and for Tishrei, but if you go out of tonight making that commitment, you can change somebody's life. And that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Those are the two short messages. So I'll just continue by saying I have the schus of uh, introducing Rav Moshe Mordechai Loi Shlita, the Mar de Asra of Agudis Yisrael, Toronto, who you should know is also a pillar for Kiruv in this city. That all, he has a, a close relationship with all of the Kiruv organizations, and they come to him for different etzos, and he has been there. So we should, uh, again, it's our honor to hear Divrei His Arus and Chizik uh, for upcoming to Rosh Hashanah. Good. Shapiro Shlita. The whole Rabbanim, the whole Oilam, and thank you, Mr. Heitman, and thank you, Project Inspire. Mr. Heitman was speaking about Kiruv. I think Project Inspire is, if we get inspired ourselves, we would automatically inspire others. If Yiddishkeit is alive by us, if Yiddishkeit is not something we do from rote, Yiddishkeit is something we live Yiddishkeit, will automatically be, people will look at us and learn from us, and we want to help others. Today, in this week's parsha, we have Atem Nitzavim Hayoim Kulchem Lefnei Hashem Aleikeichem. And the Zohar Kodesh says, Hayom Do, that's Rosh Hashanah. We're all standing a few days before Rosh Hashanah. We all went through a whole year all kinds of things happened during the year, personal things, public things, cholesterol things. And we want it, this year to be a good year. We want to be inscribed in the Sefer HaChaim. We want it to be a year of life. We have to show that we're living Yidin. I'll read to you something that I saw today from perspective Ger, a convert, we, we have, we could give always, they have to answer a lot of questions to know about Yiddishkeit. So question 12 is, what is the greatest challenge for Judaism? Give reasons to support your opinion. He writes, in, the greatest challenge therein lies in bringing and making Torah literally feel like life, that a soul will feel alive in the service of God which is a major challenge. People need to taste Hashem, to feel His presence, to learn about Hashem. As priority of education, then naturally they'll want to do more mitzvahs, God willing. It says, even those who are from, I hope to bring Torah Judaism back to all those souls, even those souls who are from, from where we're formerly from. But I want them to Live life. V'chai b'hem, b'loi shiyomaz b'hem, the Kotzke Rebbe says, Torah has to be living with Torah. Torah should be something that you feel a chiyus in Torah. Shabbos should be a lebedig Shabbos. I'm talking for our own children. If children come home and Shabbos is a beautiful Shabbos meal, Shabbos, when they see the parents love Shabbos and don't dread Shabbos, and look forward to Shabbos. We find in last week's parish in the Toichacha, the whole rebuke that the Torah gives and everything that happens, Tachas because you didn't serve Hashem with Simcha. 
And everyone questions. Because of that, you have the whole taicha happen. And the answer is, if you're not happy with Torah, you're not really serving Hashem. If you do mitzvahs begrudgingly, and you, and you do mitzvahs haphazardly, you daven haphazardly, you don't really feel you're talking to Hashem, and you don't really know that you're living a yid, taste the love of Torah, taste the love of Hashem, be close to Hashem, and that's the purpose of Slichus, and that's the purpose of Ella, and that's the purpose of Seresim and Tshuva. It's days where the Rabbi Yishlam comes close to us, and he's waiting for us to come close to him. He's waiting for us, come near to me, come closer to me. Ani l'doidi, v'doidi li. The Rabbi Yishlam is waiting to show that we really care about him. We don't do mitzvahs because we have to do mitzvahs. We, have, we do mitzvahs because we choose to do mitzvahs. In this week's parasha, in the end of the parasha, it says, Hashem says, I gave you chayim, the mothers, I gave you life and death and toy vera. Choose life. Choose Torah. Don't do Torah because it's forced on you. Realize how beautiful Torah, Tamu, look how beautiful it is. And live like that. And then it will affect your children, it will affect your friends, it will affect your family. The child sees uh, how, how happy you are with your Torah, how you, you're living with Torah. I mean, when you come to the Shabbos tish, you sing and you, and you, 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 and the Kedusha of the Shabbos tish, the Dvar Torah of the Shabbos tish, and the holiness of the Shabbos, it automatically affects everybody around. So Hashem, like the Rebbein Yoni brings down, and like the Rambam brings down with his Rachmanus, gave us days of reflection, days to to wake up from our slumber, wake up from our sleep, and, for, and not be so involved in our, our mundane life, and know there's a higher purpose in life. And the higher purpose is to be close to Hashem. The higher purpose is to be ever Hashem, to serve Hashem. Be somebody who, who really loves Hashem. And you feel the love to Hashem. Behavta Hashem Aleikecha. You love the Rabbi Nishleilam, and everyone has in his heart to love Hashem. You just have to open up your heart. And that's what Tzlichus is all about. And that's these days before Rosh Hashanah. Are days where we have to bring Yiddishkeit alive to us. Something that we live with Torah. We're happy with Torah. Happy with doing mitzvahs. Run to do a mitzvah. And run to want to do a mitzvah. I remember my Rashiva, Gon Rabchai, Matchan, Matl Katzachan, Rocha. Uh, uh, he used to, it says in, in Shekhan Aruch, you should run to go daven. You should run, it's a mitzvah lorah, it's, it's a mitzvah to run to go daven. And when, in the last years of his life, he only lived on a quarter of his heart, and he couldn't love from, run from his house to the Bismedrish. So his Rebetzin used to bring him to a few, a few feet in front of the Bismedrish, so he should be able to get out of the car, he ran into the shul. You run, run to do a mitzvah. We want to be alive with a mitzvah. Then it will also be an impression on others. Then others will also feel like you and know and live with the mitzvah. But then there's another responsibility. Is it enough only I should be happy with mitzvahs? What happens with all the children of the Rabbi Nishalaylam who don't know better, who no one ever taught them anything, we're all responsible for every yid in the, in the world. In this week's parsha, the Ramban and the Rechaim HaKadosh bring down that what's the new covenant that we have in the parsha of Netzavim? We had already a covenant in last week's parsha in Bris. They say the new covenant is the Arevus. Take responsibility on every person in the world. Take responsibility to help another yid. Take responsibility to bring another yid closer to Hashem. A person who goes around and is satisfied only with himself is not loving Hashem. These are Hashem's children. Hashem's children are lost. They're lost. I swayed like a say, like a lamb that's lost. So the Rashiva of Hebron once said, why does it say like a lost lamb? He said, if, uh, if an object is lost, you have to go find it. If a living 
object is lost, it also goes to try to find its owner. The lamb is running one way and the owner is running the other way. We, to Isi, a person who is swayed and is not far from Hashem, but he's looking for Hashem, he's searching for Hashem. And we ask Hashem to come and bring us back. And Hashem gives a duty for every Yid. Go help another Yid. Go try to show another Yid how beautiful Torah is. Go, if you really love me, Go and, if you really love me, Hashem says, if you really care about me, care about my children, how could you live next to a person who blatantly doesn't do the mitzvahs and you know you could make a difference in that person's life? People always say, no, they're scared to, to speak to others, scared to try to influence others. There's a story, the Klozim Ger Rebbe Zechayin most, most of you heard of him, after the war, he brought hundreds of people, thousands of people back to Yiddishkeit. And when he passed away in 1994, a woman came into the Rebetzin sitting shiva with the children, and she had a bag in her hand, and they asked her what her name is, and the, the name didn't ring any bell, they said, she said, I came here for one reason. The only reason I'm from is because of this bag. I said, what is... She opened up the bag and took out a pair of white socks. She says, after the war, and she was walking in, 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 in Ferenfeld, where the Bozberger was, and two girls were walking without socks on their feet. The Klozmogger Rebbe walked over to them in a nice way. He said, Yiddish Shekindle, you know girls shouldn't walk around like this. So they started crying, Rebbe, you want us to put on socks? We don't have any bread to eat. We, you're asking us to wear socks? So the Rebbe sat down there in the middle of the street and took off his white socks that he was wearing and gave it to me to wear. And these socks stayed with me my whole life. And here she brought the bag of socks and brought it back to the family. This is what gave me my spiritual life. This is what brought my life back. Sometimes a small thing you do for another person, a small thing you do for, for another Yid, you, you, and, and you care about another Yid. You care, you know, hesitate, should I tell her to wear socks, tell her not tell her to wear socks, but you say it in a nice way, and it stays an impression because of that this woman raised families and families of Frumet children. And just imagine the schus when the Kozmog Rebbe goes in Shemayim, when he went to Shemayim, the thousands and thousands of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren that because of, of his little actions, the same time, there's another story that happened also on Erev Yom Kippur, the same year, in 1945, the Klozberger Rebbe was sitting, reading, preparing for Kal Nidre, and there was a knock on the door, a soft knock on the door. He goes, opens the door, and there's a 17-year-old girl standing there crying. She says, I'm left alone. Every Arab Yom Kippur, my father used to bench me. My mother used to bench me. There's nobody here to bench me now. Rebbe, what should I do? And here, you know, the holy Rebbe, the Rebbe says, come here. The Rebbe took a handkerchief and put it over her head and put his hand on the, and, and benched her like a father would bench a daughter. He says, my daughter, you're my daughter now, I'm benching you. She went out, or oh, a few minutes later, another knock came at the door. Another girl heard what happened to the first girl. She also came, said, Rebbe, you have to bench me also. I also have no parents. Eighty-seven girls came in to get benched from the Rebbe. And just imagine how many families came from those 87 girls. How many families came caring about another individual, feeling for another individual, doing for another individual. You know, we were talking about the uh, Shabbos project. Now, last year, we all know in the community how many people were influenced by the Shabbos project. Shabbos project is in Parshish Lech Lecha. There's a beautiful Zohar Kodesh in Parshish Lech Lecha, in Zohar Kodesh. And in the, in the Zohar says, when Avram, Avram heard 
that Lot was captured. So the Zohar says it's an anal, an, uh, it's a marshal to the Yitzhahara. He heard that people were caught by the Yitzhahara. So he went to go save the people. And he went to make him, and, and he ran till done to, to save them from the Yitzhahara. He says, what's the reward for a person who, who helps another person come back to Yiddishkeit? The Zohar Kodesh says, what's the reward? So the Zohar Kodesh says, Malki Tzedek is Michal, the Malach Michal. The Malach Michal who sits by the gate of Tzedek of Tzedekim. Malki Tzedek, Melech Sholem, is the Melech of Yishlaim in Lemalo and Shemaim. He says, when these Neshamas who helped other people come from, who helped other people in Yiddish and from doesn't even mean someone is completely not from. If you help someone who who, who swayed away a little. You bring him back a little. Help people come back to the Rabbi Nishalayim. So the Zohar Kodesh says, the Michal goes to those people and brings out Lechem Yain and says, come, come, Bo'el Shalom. You're the peace. You brought the Rabbi Nishalayim to the world. The Zohar Kodesh in Truma says that if anyone would ever know the schus it is to go help other people come back to Yiddishkeit. They would run for it like they run for life. You're looking to be signed in the safer of life. You want to find life. Find another Yid that you could help. A Yid that fell away, or a Yid that never knew anything. Find him and you'll find life. You run like you would run for life. And, and, and th- that's the mitzvah. The mitzvah is, there's a Zohar Chodesh brings also that there, there's a baskel that goes out, Ashrei, praiseworthy is the person who goes, who learns Torah and runs and helps other keep mitzvahs, even if sometimes there's some pain with it. I'll continue reading from this person what he wrote. I believe the greatest challenge for Judaism is to figure out a way to connect those Jews who have no connection to their Father in heaven back to Hashem. Here, this is a Kambara's writing. Unfortunately, many reject Torah not out of, out of knowing what Torah is, but of false notions and misperceptions that are accumulated through various misunderstandings. We need to find a way to understand the needs of the generation, to speak of a Torah in their language that can enter their hearts. Most secular Jews will not respond to rebuke. They do not know Torah as Eitzachayim, so what is the point of rebuke? Unfortunately, a lot of Orthodox world is inaccessible and intimidating for the secular, with the exception of some cure of organizations. And that's what Project Inspire is here to. Every one of us is a cure. It's not only the cure of organizations that have to do cure. The responsibility is on every person. And the Zohar Kodesh brings down that someone who was able to be Makar and Chas Shalom is not Makar. It says what the punishment is. If you could go it says, uh, the Rebbein Yoyin brings down, when we come to Yom Adin, and Rebbein Yoyin, you come and ask Hashem to forgive you, to help you. The Rebbein Yoyin says, what did you do for other people? And if somebody says that someone, you could have stopped him from sinning, and you didn't stop him, it's considered like you sinned. It's considered like you had that sin. If you were able to stop a Yid from doing something, and you didn't because, you know, you didn't want him to look, think that you... You're proselytizing, you want them to think that you are you're, 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 you're bothering them, and you could have stopped them. You could have been a person, bring a person closer. I remember one year at the Gura Convention, they had a person who became about Shuva get up, and he said, You know, if somebody would have, when, when I wasn't from, somebody would just come over one time and show me how beautiful it is. People are scared that the religious people ran away from me like I'd be something contaminated. They didn't want to talk to me. Talk to her, not from a Yid. Show my Yiddishkeit. Remember, as a child, we grew up, we had a neighbor that wasn't keeping Torah mitzvahs. My parents used to, my parents were European Yidden, weren't into Kirv. But the heart here, they invited these people. They lived on in, in, in the floor next door. They invited them to our, our sukkah. They invited them to bench Esrig. And for years and years later, what, what they remembered about it, how beautiful it was that they were invited to come and see a sukkah, see a sukkah. I remember there was one year where Beis Yankov started that, that Shlachman should be sent to neighbors. 
a Svenska Shlita. He said he used to walk from his house to, to, Beisiang, to the to school every day, and he saw all those doors with mezuzahs, and never so far from Yiddishkeit. He said, just send Shlachmanus to one neighbor. We sent Shlachmanus to a neighbor two doors away. She came running back. She didn't see Shlachmanus for years, and she sent us back Shlachmanus, and, every, and, and reawakened the Yiddishkeit in the person, reawakened something in the other person. If you care about the Rabbi Nishalaylam, you care about his children. And, and, and if you don't care about his children, it means you don't really care about the Rabbi Nishalaylam. If you really love the Rabbi Nishalaylam, you know, and you know that you care about him, how can I help your children? How can I do something for your children? There's a mushal what they give. There's a, a child that was going uh, on, on camping and going so, and the father told me, you'll come in this town, I have a very close friend over there, and go to them, and if you, anything you need, you'll get there. This child was robbed, he was left without anything on him, and he comes to that little town, and he goes to his father's friend, he knocks on the door, and he says, could you please give me a piece of bread, I have nothing, nothing. He says, what are you bothering me, go away, go away. He says, my father told me to come. You're making me crazy. What do you want from me here? I'm busy now. Go away. Come back another time. And this child went from house to house till he was able to get something, to mooch things, to, to be able to, to have some food, until he got back some money to come back home. And he came back home, and he told his father, you wouldn't believe what happened. I was completely downtrodden. I had nothing, nothing. I went to that person's house, and he didn't want to do anything for me. A few months later, that person in that small town needed a favor. He needed his friend in this big city to, to do something for him. He comes to his friend and he says, you know, I'm really, I'm going bankrupt. I need someone to, to, to bail me out, help me out. And he looks at him, he says, do you know who I am? He says, sure, you're, we're good friends. Are we really good friends? What happened when my son came to your house? Did you do anything for him? And he started crying. I didn't realize, I didn't realize. When we come to the Rabbi Nishalaylam, and ask the Rabbi Nishalaylam, help me, Rabbi Nishalaylam. And Rabbi Nishalaylam says, I, am I really your friend? Are you really my friend? What did you do for my children that are lost? They're going around downtrodden. They have nothing in life. Do you do anything for them? Your next door neighbor who doesn't know anything about Chavez. Your friend that went off the derech, did you do anything to help them? Do you do anything for them? And what do we answer to Rabbi Nishleilam? I'm a descendant of the king of Poland for one day. There was the king of Poland, his name was Shaul Val. He became, he was king of Poland for one day. My mother's family's name used to be Val, they changed it afterwards. And the direct descendants, so we have royal blood from the Polish dynasty, besides Dobra Melech, the Yiddish dynasty. But so how did Cholval become king of Poland? Because the prince was lost and, and came to the town where Cholval lived. And, and no one helped him, because he didn't, no one believed in him, he's really the prince. He went around and he came to Cholval's home, and Cholval said, what can I do for you? He didn't care, does he look like the prince? Does he not look like he helped him? Later on, when Shalvo came to, to the capital and, he, and the king's son, the prince said, you know that person, he is the one who saved my life. Without him, I wouldn't have been here. So when the king died, and there was a big question, who should be the next king? The prince said, I want Shalvo to be the king. But he wasn't, he didn't have Polish blood, but he became king. And that day that he became king, he changed all the decrees that were against Yidden. He tore up all the decrees against Yidden. If you help the king's son, the king will help you. If we help the Rabbi Nishlam's children, we scream, Avinu Malkein, you are our father, you are our king. Do we really believe he's our father? Do we really believe that what do we do to his children? And that's we have to go out of our way to do things and caring about our children. Show him how beautiful Yiddishkeit is. It's sure, it's like we said, it's hard. sometimes it's hard. Somebody, yesterday, you know, every Bernstein makes Hashgokha protest, they came to ask me, they have guests for Shabbos. And they found out that the guests don't really keep Shabbos. 
and they don't even make brachas out of their house. And they said, they feel maybe they shouldn't invite them anymore. I said, what do you mean you shouldn't invite them? So when Avram Avinu invited guests to their home, did he look, check if they're keeping Shabbos? Did he check if they make brachas? He made brachas with them. Well, they're faking, they come, look, but you never know. You, your mitzvahs, bring him into your home. Bring him into your home. Bring him into your home. And show him how beautiful Yiddishkeit is. Show him, you never know what it does. And just for the mitzvah of caring of Rabbi Nisham's children, take my children in, Rabbi Nisham says. Rabbi Nisham should help. We're all asking, we should have a good geben shtior. We're all waiting for Mashiach. We're all waiting for the geula. The Hashem should gather all the scattered in the world. We have to show the Rabbi Nisham that we gather the scattered neshamas. We have to show the Rabbi Nisham that we care. And Rabbi Nisham sent down in this generation, a few great people, Chavetz Chaim, Chazonish, who Meir Shapiro, and he sent down Hagon Reb Noach Weinberg Zechayin Levracha, who understood what it means to inspire Yidden. He said, you know, he said, if every Yid would just get one, more, every from a Yid would get one more from a Yid, one Yid to become from. Just imagine the revolution of Yiddishkeit in the world. Just imagine what would happen. There would be a big revolution They're coming back to the Rabbeinu Shleilam and be the biggest Balchuva movement, the biggest Kirv movement as every from a Yid takes upon himself when he leaves here, takes himself, told Rosh Hashanah, I'll try to have one family, one person that I could speak to, to do one mitzvah. And that's Chus will help, that we should all be zoiche, to be written the Sefer Achaim in a good life, Chaim Toivim, Aruchim, Chaim shall bracha. We should be all be zoichet to exceed exceed mitayvim, and we should be zoichet to be a shnas geula be Yeshua, and we should be be as Mashiach from here. We may know Amen. A good yontem. Thank you very much, Rabbi Lowy. I feel like I follow Rabbi Lowy around because Baruch Hashem, he married somebody from Detroit, and I'm from Detroit. And then I, I moved here, and my shver is very close to the Rav, so uh, he's always been an incredible support to everybody who's in Kirov. So I just want to give you a quick perspective before I introduce Rabbi Shapiro, that I work, I say I don't talk to anybody who's from. My entire day, other than with Project Inspire, they try to change it. But uh, by and large, I deal with people who are, you know, don't necessarily look exactly like all of us. And it's pretty incredible. I had over a family who's totally secular. The father told me he's an existentialist Jew. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, we shouldn't eat sea fish or shellfish because they gather all these microorganisms from the ground. And, you know, uh, it's nice to have family dinner because it's good for you. And I'm very, I told my kids that they must, must marry a Jew. And none of them listened to me. And I made a mistake. I didn't marry a Jew, and they didn't either. I said, Baruch Hashem. And then he tells me that his daughter got very inspired on one of our Israel trips. And they wanted to bring her a treat, but they realized lobster is not kosher, but they said they won't tell her it's what it really is. She'll never know. So she comes home, and she's very inspired. And they serve her the lobster. She says, what is it, lobster? And she says, wait one second. They gave me a book of brachas. Let me look it up. And she starts leaving. She said, I can't find a bracha on lobster. Never, you know. But uh, bar it's amazing. And these people were willing to come over for Shabbos. And that's what, and they own a store that many from people go to. But I don't think anybody ever invited them. And it's really incredible that if we just think who we could have. I'll tell you a quick story. I was a counselor in Camp Simcha, and I had a camper, Brian, who since has passed away, unfortunately. And he lived three blocks away from my house in Detroit, and I was away in Eretz Yisrael. I called my mother up. I said, can you please give Brian Mishloch? She said, fine. She comes home. I call her back half an hour later, and she says, you gave me the wrong address. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, there was an Xmas wreath on the door. There were lights up. It's the wrong. I said, no, that's the house. She goes back. She gives it to them. There were two dogs and a cat, a huge TV. She was shaken up. She's like an Alta Yiddish mama. And this family had no shaykhs. After he passed away, about two weeks later, the owner of the local Judaica store called my mother and said, do you know this family? came into my Judaica store, and they decided to buy a mezuzah. They were so touched by the way these yeshiva bachram came to help them in the last moments of Brian's life that they decided to do something more. And we never know how we could touch everybody. So I just wanted to share with you, to introduce 
Dr. Leiby Weiss. Dr. Leiby Weiss sent me an email today how he decided to challenge many people on his block to give out an easy outreach gift. We're selling them, if you want, for $6, or $5.99 actually, but we don't give change. So $6 outside. So I highly recommend that you uh, go out and get some. And there's a fellow over here in our front row, Andrew, who he didn't buy them. He decided his wife was baking gifts or honey cakes. So he said, why bake one honey cake? Bake seven, obviously, and give them all out. But he didn't want to knock on doors, so he hung them up outside people's doors, and then they came up back, and they started giving him gifts in return. So it's actually worthwhile, because if you're looking for any gifts at this time of year, you could start giving out your own gifts. So just quickly, just uh, wanted to thank, before I introduce Dr. Weiss, Rabbi Sampson, who came in special from New York. Rabbi Sampson, whenever anybody asks me, is Project Inspire for real? Like, what do they really do? So I say, you have to meet Rabbi Sampson, because this is a man who has so much passion, and he's convinced that we are going to change the world. And I'm also convinced, and the truth is, I think, Baruch Hashem, there are many more women here than men. And I've told people we don't even need the men. Because there's somebody who, used to, who I used to work with, who I've been in touch with, maybe some of you know her, Mrs. Adina Rudinsky, don't tell her that I mentioned her name, or Bistritzer. And she decided for the Shabbos project, she's going to invite everybody on her block for Shabbos. So she told her parents, told some others, right, got some other families involved, and she put out an invitation every door. And there became a whole fight with people on the block that they were upset that they weren't invited. So they said next year, Mr. Chen, but it was a beautiful suda. And there are many, many, but somebody just told me he hosted a big party on his block for stum, for non from people, just to engage them. So it's something everybody could do. And you don't have to wait for your parents or anybody else, just tell them you want to invite people and do it. Vizeho. You didn't hear that from me, but I definitely recommend it. One final thing before I call up um, Dr. Weiss is I really want to thank Torah Masora, Dr. Mar Marvin Sigler, because they have an event tonight and we promised them that we're going to try to end at a reasonable time so people can make it to Ray Becher. Ray Becher has spoken many, many times for Project Inspire, and I know Dr. Sigl uh, Mr. Sigler is also bringing in Rabbi Krohn, through uh, Chaim, that's after, uh, right before Yom Kippur, which I highly recommend to go. He also speaks all the time for Project Inspire. So everybody's into the mission. The question is how to do it. So hopefully you'll figure that out tonight from Dr. Weiss. Um, so Rabbi Irons asked me just to speak for a few minutes to tell you why I feel so strongly about this and why I challenge my friends and bribe them to, to call people over. So uh, there, there's really two reasons. One is that I'm, I'm sort of like a cure of addict, because once you make somebody from, it's kind of like making a shidduch. shidduch. If you've ever made a shidduch, you have this enormous sense of nachas from the couple, and then when they have children, you feel like they're your own. When you make somebody from, and, and I'll, I'll qualify that statement, because you don't have to make them from, you just have to give them the opportunity. But when somebody becomes from because you're their friend, you have enormous nachas from it. And I do it, I, I would love to say that I do it for all of the the lofty reasons that we've heard about, and, and they're, all, they're all true, but, but there are very few things that you'll get as much satisfaction out of as the continued nachas that you have from a from family. So, so I'll tell you about one situation that happened, and actually Rabbi Lowy was a part of it. Rabbi Lowy gave me a book called Jews for Nothing many years ago, Jews for Nothing. And I, never, I actually gave you back a different one. I had to buy it on eBay because the guy I gave it to that sub subsequently became from because of it didn't give it back to me and I didn't want to ask for it. So I had to go on eBay and buy this book for many, many times more than it was worth because maybe it was out of print. And I gave it back to you many, many years later, but he kept it. And he's now from, he has a from family, and, and I, I just have nachas from him. And, and it's funny because he started going to Adaf Yomi Shir, and he was, giving, he was going to this shir in a certain shul, and I got a mailing from the shul because they were having a raffle. And I, it was a random sort of mailing. I'm not normally on their list, which is, I guess, in itself surprising, but I wasn't. And I said to my wife, you know what, I'm going to buy tickets. And she says, you have nothing to do with them. And I said, I do. That guy goes there, and I'm so proud of him. I'm going to buy a, sh uh, a ticket because I want to support the shul. And I won the tickets to Israel. <laughs> so so that, was, uh, th that was excellent. Um, so, so one of the reasons I do it is because it just feels good. When you, when you make somebody from, you have nachas, and, and that itself is a, a re you know, reason enough. There is another reason I do it, and that is for my parents. My parents, Aleyha Mashalam, were both Holocaust survivors. They both, they both went through Auschwitz. And my mother said to me, 
um, that she says to me, Laiba, you know, we lost a lot, but in the end I won. Because she, thank God, had three from children. But globally we're losing. We're losing to assimilation, we're losing to intermarriage, we're losing to apathy, and I think we're losing to affluence. Um, and I think that probably the first three have a lot to do with affluence. Do you know in, in Israel what the biggest travel days are of the whole year where you can hardly get a room in a European resort? Rosh Hashanah. They travel because they don't know any better. In, in Israel, the Jews are going to Europe on Rosh Hashanah. We have people down our block. My wife has been dropping into them forever. She, a, a number of years ago, she invited them for Rosh Hashanah. Sorry, Disney World. They're not home. They're leaving on Rosh Hashanah. So if we don't do it, nobody's going to do it. So I do it because it feels good, and I do it because my mother, my mother in her own family won, thank God. But, but globally, we're losing. And, and I feel like I have, to, I have to make her win. I have to make all the people who went through the Holocaust, and we lost six million neshamas, we have to, we have to fight. God will help us, but we have to do our part. Where it leads, you know, that's up to Shemaim. Um, I made a comment, so those are the two reasons why I do it. I just want to make one comment. Sometimes we talk about making people from. You know, my friends say to me, well, how do you make somebody from? You don't have to make them from. All you have to do is open your heart. There's a neshama in every Jew. That neshama is a spark. And that is something that they're not necessarily aware of. But if you open your Jewish heart to them, and you're their friend, and you show them love, it's like oxygen for that flame. And you don't have to do anything else. They may ask you questions that you don't know the answers to, and that's fine. We don't have to. We're human. You can go find out. You can learn with them. You can go ask a rabbi. You can... That's okay. Uh, and don't be afraid of the questions. We may have those questions ourselves. We have to ask them, and there are good answers. Um, but just open your hearts. And it's easy, and Project Inspired uh, makes it very easy because you, you just give out these, these little boxes, just like the, the honey cake. Just take one, hang it on one door in your community, and if one, you know, 10% of us, you know, get a hit, you know, they say with mass marketing there's a certain return rate that they expect. Well, we, if we all do it, there's a certain percentage that will be successful. And isn't that worth it if it's even one family? So you, you, and you're not asking them for anything at that point. You're just giving them a present. And most people know about Rosh Hashanah. Give them out this little gift. So what I did to challenge my friends is I actually bought 20 of them. My two kids are now delivering them with a little note from my friends saying, you know, now you have no excuse. Just give it away to somebody. I even bought them for you. So I hope that they do. Um, and, uh, and that I hope, you know, we're all successful. So that, that's, that's my story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Weiss. I'd like to just thank Ms. Samuel Schiff, who really was a lifesaver for tonight's event. She came, she came to help with Project Inspire, and uh, I don't think any of us would be here tonight if not for her. So thank you so much, and I'd like to thank all the volunteers and everybody else who's helped. I came to Beis Yaakov here. I didn't go to Beis Yaakov, but I came here, I think, uh, two weeks ago, or no, whenever school started, the first day of school. And they were so stressed. I said, why are you so stressed? So they said, it's crazy Baruch Hashem. We have so many kids coming. And I said, just think about it. There isn't a single school in the city that is not observant, that's not from, that has increasing enrollment. There isn't one. And I said, you should be very happy that Baruch Hashem and the firm world were bursting by the seams and my own kids, Cheder, could use a new building, if anybody here wants to give it. And it, it's really, on one hand, the Pew report just came out this week that the firm community is growing by leaps and bounds, Baruch Hashem, and unfortunately, those who are not affiliated are becoming much less affiliated. But I believe, and I work on this on the front ground, and I see some people over here who I'm close with, who never would have gone on the journey that they went on if not for their neighbors, if not for, I saw somebody today at Shul, and he told me his last name, I said, wait, I know your last name, but you're not from here, like you don't live around there. He says, that's true, I live in Eretz Yisrael, I came back to Russia. I said, but I know that there are a couple of people from NCSY who go to you every single week, not to you, to your parents. And he said, yeah, that's true, I know those people. And Baruch Hashem, they're living amazing lives. So every one of us could make that difference. I'd also like to thank all of the Shul representatives most of whom who have come here tonight, some have not, who are really representing their shuls and making sure that in every single shul in Toronto, we have representatives who are trying to spread the word. We're actually looking for 
female representatives. So you can let Amiela know if you're interested in that. And also, everybody should have gotten a pledge card at the back. This is not for money, although if you want to give donations, there is a table on the outside. But there's a pledge card to make sure that we're Mizaka B'yem Adin. And the way that we do that is pledging to care about Klal Yisrael, at the very least, Davin, obviously. But there's so much more that we could also be doing. And obviously, if we don't Davin, I think it, the question is if we care, as Rabbi Lowy said. At this time, I'd like to introduce Rabbi Shapiro. The way I came to Rabbi Shapiro is I attended the Project Inspire convention in February. And they had pushed me. I was coming on board through NCSY with Project Inspire. They pushed me to come. And the truth is, forget about any, I just, the gosh, miss, I've never seen. In Toronto, Baruch Hashem, we're, we're doing all right. But if you want gosh, miss, Baruch Hashem, uh, the Project Inspire convention is where to go in February. But the Ruchnius was unbelievable, and Rabbi Shapiro was a keynote over there, and I heard him once Friday night, and I decided I am going to every single talk by Rabbi Shapiro on Baruch Hashem. I went, and my shver afterwards went to his shul, and it's really incredible, and it's a big schuss. When we were thinking, who should we bring to Toronto? So we said that, obviously, we had to bring Rabbi Shapiro, and at this time, I'd like to introduce Rabbi Shapiro. Firstly, I want to begin Bershus the Meir de Asra, Haravloi Shlita, who is not only the Meir de Asra and someone that Klal Yisrael turns to, but someone that I also consider to be one of my Rabbeim. And when I have a Shaila or just uh, will ask something, Eitzah, uh, just a moment ago I asked Haravloi a Shaila. And so for me to speak in the presence of the Meir de Asra Shlita, is a, a very, very big schus. And I hope HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give the Rav and the entire Mishpacha, the Koyach and Gizunt, to continue inspiring all of Klal Yisrael. I know Project Inspire at one point, uh, I think on one of their videos they said, describe the weekend without using the word inspire. And I don't think anybody did. Or maybe a lot of people did, but it was a challenge. So I'm sorry to open up by using the word inspire, but it's not easy a few days before Rosh Hashanah to travel, to come here. I live in South Florida. But I could only imagine how difficult it must be to have to come out for an entire evening. And I am truly inspired that hundreds, I am looking at hundreds of Anoshim Chashuvim, Anoshim Tzedkaniyais, that just a few days before Rosh Hashanah, Tavshin Ayin Vav came out. And that, to me, is truly inspirational. Just the fact that the hundreds came out tonight here in Toronto on behalf of Project Inspire, as all of the flyers said to see what could we do for a good judgment on Yaim Hadin, just from the fact that the hundreds of you came out, the Rebbe Nishalayim should grant each and every one of you the Anoshim Chashuvim, the Anoshim Sidkoniyais, your families, to have a Gebench de Gebench de Gesuntayar, and where you should experience only Yiddish Anachas from your families and enjoy it together with your families. Amen. Your coming is truly inspiring. I am here because of Rablaib Irons. He, uh, We've had, I can't even imagine how many phone calls back and forth, the logistics, the planning, the flying, the car services, and all of the details. It's a credit to Rablaib, and thank you very much for giving me the chance to be Mezaka the Rabbim. And uh, just Achron, Achron Choviv to just mention before we actually start, to speak in the presence of Reb Chaim Samson. Reb Chaim Samson is the international director of Project Inspire. He's sitting somewhere in the audience just trying to blend in and camouflage himself. Reb Chaim, that doesn't happen. Because as the international director of Project Inspire, someone who's really changing the world, helping us realize what our achrayas is, the fact that he's here tonight and that he and Project Inspire allowed me to be here tonight I have tremendous akar satoiv to Reb Chaim. I say, ein milim befila habia rikshay levavi to express how how awesome it is 
to be in your presence. All of the flyers and the information that went out about tonight was how we can properly uh, merit good judgment. We're just a few days before Rosh Hashanah. I think the words of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter to begin tonight jump at us. When Rabbi Yisrael Salanter was addressing this question, what can you do to be meritorious in judgment? Rebina Shalaylam, we want to have a good Gebench to Gesunta Yar. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter says, and I quote, Ki the single best piece of advice, the Eitza par excellence, bar none, lihiyos ish, sherabim tzrichim loy. Lihiyos ish, sherabim tzrichim loy. Become someone that other people need. Become someone to whom many people will say, I need him or I need her. They're indispensable to my existence. That's a quote from Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. The ticket is to how many people are you indispensable? To how many people do they feel, I can't get along without that person, I need them? That, says Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, is the ticket how to Be'ezra Hashem approach the Yemei Din. So thinking a great amount about tonight's talk, I'd like to take it from the following vantage point. We're going to divide the talk into two parts, following that which Chazal say, Sur Meira Va'asei Toiv. First, you've got to remove the bad before you could accentuate the good. And I'd like to hopefully accomplish this goal by taking one word that has the same three letters, ayin, resh, vez, and in tonight's words, giving it three separate meanings. So hopefully that will be an easy way for you to remember what we say tonight. First is sur meira, then is asay toiv, and I know that there are three ways to translate ayin, resh, vez. Here's the first. Sur meira means we have to get rid of a certain problem. Right after the Yemei Din, we approach Sukkot, we take the Dalad Minim. I once heard in the name of Ramort Chabanet of Nitra, an incredible pshat. Did you ever notice something unique? When you take the Dalad Minim, three of the four are spoken about in a very, very endearing way. We speak about the Esroig. In fact, people will spend a fortune, and in many cases, rightfully so, for that Esroig Muhudar. Talk about the Lulav. I remember, and I'm certainly not the oldest one in the room, when it came to the Lulav, we used to protect it in a plastic case. Then that became a hard plastic. Now there's like a virtual tank to protect your lulav. And hadasim. People will spend money on hadasim as well. But why is it that when you go to buy the Dalad Minim, did you ever notice the one who's selling it to you will say, here's the price and uh, I'll throw in the aravos. And after a few days when the aravos have become black, come back to me, I'll give you another one. What did the Arava do wrong? There's the first word of Ayin Reish Vez, Arava. What did the Arava do wrong? The way we talk about the Esroigim, the Lulovim, the Hadassim, rightfully so. But why does the Arava get the short end of the deal? Rav Mordecha Benet Minaitra tells us, because look where the Dalad Minim come from, for the most part. Esroigim will get from the finest pardesim, the orchards in Eretz Yisrael, from overseas, thousands of miles away. Lulavim. Lulavim as well. They come in mostly, many come from France and many come from different places in Europe. The finest Lulavim. 
Hadassim as well will be shipped from overseas, some from, from China, different places in the Orient. But all those three I just mentioned, they come from thousands of miles away. You know where many people get their aravais from? Yeah, their own backyard. Many people grow aravais in their backyard, and they simply cut it. Says Ramorcha Banet Mi Naitra, that's the answer to the question. The Lulavim and the Esraigim and the Hadassim are spoken about with awe and reverence because the mystique is there. They come from afar. But the Arava? In my own backyard? We tend to take that for granted. Those who are nearest to us and those who are dearest to us, we tend to take for granted. And that's why the Arav is in my backyard. I'll throw it in. And if after three days something happens, I'll give you another one. Because when something comes from far away, there's a mystique, there's an awe, there's a reverence. But those that are closest to us, our spouses, our siblings, the nearest and dearest, we tend to take them for granted. You know what a Mortchabanet of Nitra says about the Arava? That's a ginormous mistake. You know why? Because take a look at the Gemara and Sukkah. When the Yom Tif is coming to an end and the Kayanim circle around the Mizbeach, and the Yom Tif is closing... What do they circle the Mizbeach with at the end of the day when all is said and done? It's not the Esroigim, it's not the Lulavim, and it's not the Hadassim, the Gemara says. They encircle the Mizbeach with just the Arava. Because at the end of the day, all we have, the nearest and dearest, the Arava in our life. Now, no one should go to their spouse or sibling and say, how's my Arava doing? That's not a good idea. Rabbi say that's where tonight's topic starts. We're looking for that Rabbim that need us, to whom we're indispensable. Look no further than across your kitchen table. Because sometimes the Arava is taken for granted. We're with them all the time. It's interesting, the word family and familiarity have most of the same letters because with our family we are most familiar. That has a maila, but that has a huge chisaron because sometimes we take them for granted. And at the end of the day when the yontif is over and the mystique and the hadassim and the lulavim and the sreigim are no longer in your lives, you can't depend and count on them. You know who you have? The arava. So in dealing with Sur Meirah, we first have to make sure, like Rabbi Yisrael Salanter said, that the rabbin that need us, our spouse, our siblings, our parents, our children. We can't begin tonight by looking any further than our kitchen table is all in order with the Aravos in our life, those who are nearest and dearest. That's question number one, because if the answer is no, that's where it starts with. The rabbim is not the rabbim that's thousands of miles away. The rabbim starts with my family. My father, Harav Mordechai Shapiro Zatzal, tells us a fabulous way to be successful in these relationships, these Arava relationships. It says in Pirkei Yavais that one of the Miracles in the base Hamigdash was Oimdim Tsefufim Mishtachavim Revachim. Literally, that means that when they stood, it was very cramped and crowded, but when they would bow, there was ample room. Oimdim Tsefufim Mishtachavim Revachim. My father said a Givaldic Evart, 101 in a relationship with an Arava. Oimdim, if you're always going to stand your ground rigidly, I'm right, I'm right, and you never capitulate. Tzifufim, the whole relationship will be miserable, crowded, and cramped. Mishtachavim, if you're willing to bow and bend, hear the other person's point of view, give them the time of day, validate them, then revachim, the whole relationship will be something of revach, a thing of beauty. That's a vart. Take that with you into Rosh Hashanah. Reb Chaim, I see you like that vart. 
Oindim tsefufim, when you deal with the arova, those nearest and dearest, we can't be so rigid and not hear the other person's point of view and always putting them down. It will be tsefufim, it will be miserable. Mishtachavim, validate, give them the time of day, show them the love, revachim, that's the ticket. In fact, a little while ago, I saw in a sefer, Umasu Ka'or, a gematria, that I think is going down in my books as one of the most sensational and delectable ones I ever saw. It says in Kairach, Rashi says, what did Kairach do wrong? Which literally means he took himself off to the side and he separated himself from everyone. He put himself on at one tzad, one side. In other words, he didn't get along with the rabbim, the tzibur. I saw the following gematria brought down. The proper way to go to any relationship with those aravis, those in your life, when you approach them, there will be disagreements, there will be issues, there will be different things that come up. You have to realize it's not like Koirach said, there's only one tzad, my way or no way. What? You have to realize, I have a tzad, but so do you. I have to view everything with this tzad and that tzad. And if you do that, the numeric value of the word tzad, tzad di dalid, is 94. A wise person does what I just told you. They face the Arov and they say, you know, this is how I feel, but I hear your point. Tzad and Tzad. 94 times 2 is 188. The Hebrew for the word a wise man is a pikeach. Pe kuf ches. It's 188. You know what makes you a pikeach in a relationship? Realize there's my Tzad and the other Tzad. And I've got to validate it as well. Now here's the thing of beauty. I have to do that, but so do you. I have to view it with a tzad here and here, and so do you. That means I'm bringing in, so to speak, the power of a pikeach 188, but you must also be a pikeach. You're bringing your own 188. What do you get when you bring pikeach together? 188 times 2, 376. The word shalom, peace, shin lamed vav mem, is 376. I hold that's a gematria. Step number one to Sur Meira, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter says, you want to be Zoycha Bedin? Make sure that people find you to be indispensable. Don't start by looking outside, look inside. It's making amends with a sibling or whoever it might be, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, making sure the spouse is being treated properly. It all begins by valuing the Arava nearest and dearest because at the end of the day, when everything else is gone, you know who will be there for you? The Arava. And the first thing to do to make sure, Sur Meira, that we get rid of this negativity is realize the next time I feel when she calls me, when he calls me, right away there's an issue. One minute. I'm going to be a Pikeach. There's my side and there's her side. Together, that's pikeach. And if you'll do the same, I'll be a pikeach and you'll be a pikeach, 188 times 2 is shalom, 376. That's the way to have and bring peace to the world. It starts with the sur meira. One final note before we speak about the next group that Rabbi Yisrael Salanta might be talking about. Sometimes when we speak negatively of these people in our families, or might be another yid, we're very quick to use a word that's not so nice. Be Michael me. Ah, he's a koifer. She's a koifer. A koifer means essentially they deny, they're no good. We're quick to write people off. Rabbi Sa, you know what the root of the word koifer is? When Nayach was told to cover the teva, the Pasuk says, v'chafarta, you should cover it. You know what the root etymologically of the word koifer is? V'chafarta. It's covered over. But the beauty is there. And so the next time we're very quick to turn to someone in an argument and not to hear their point of view, but to stand rigid. I'm right. Tell yourself, really, you think they're a kaifer? Kaifer is from the word v'chafarta. The beauty is covered over. They're a gem. 
They're a jewel. Every yid is. But sometimes it may be v'chafarta. It may be covered over. I just saw a week ago a vort in the, from the Barditcher Rebbe. Rebbe Levi Yitzchok ben Sarasosh. Imagine taking this into Yontif in the v'chol ma'minim that we'll say in a few days. It says v'chol ma'minim and then the second part of the stanza is ha'toiva ha'metiv la'royim ve'la'toiva. I know it's a song but believe it or not, before it was a song, it was actually part of the tefillah. <laughs> says, hey, look at Barditch of Rebbe, la royim ve la toivim, ha toiv, ha la royim ve Listen to a vart, we should turn to the Rebbein Shalom and say, Rebbein Shalom, ha toiv, ha meitiv la royim. If you'll just be good to those who are ra, those who seem to be evil and bad, you'll see, ve la toivim, they'll really be good. We ask the Rebbeinu Shalayim Hatayv Ameitav Larayim. Look at those that we think are bad. Give them a little parnasa. Give them shalom. Give them gezunt, and you'll see the chafarta. Really, their goodness is covered over. And those that we think are rayim vilatoyvim, they will be, and they are intrinsically good. We have to emulate the ways of the Rebbeinu Shalayim. Let's stop viewing people as royim. They're no good. They're a kaifer. You know what? Hatoiva hametiv. Show them a little bit of goodness, a little bit of light, a little bit of love, and those that you think are royim, vilatoivim. They will be oh so good. Now that we've taken care of the business of Sur Meira, and I will make amends, we will make amends before Rosh Hashanah. With an arava, say something we should have said a while ago, fix something we should have done a while ago, we'll do it by realizing I and they will be a pikeach and that will bring shalom. Now that we've taken care of the arava, let's move on to another root of ayin reish bays and bring us to the part of after sur meira asay toiv, just to look and to do good. The Radomsky Rebbe says a vort, I believe I said this at the convention a few months ago, the one you referred to. You're looking to have your tefillahs answered, is that right? You know what it says in Shir Hashirim? Hashmi'ini es kailech ki kailech orev. We ask Hashem, listen to our voice because we have orev. There's that word again. Ayin reish veiz. Sweet, says the Radomsky No. Don't read the word orev as sweet, but rather as arevus. Arevus means responsibility. The Rav spoke extensively about that earlier. Says the Radomsky Rebbe, you want your tefillahs answered? Here's the key. Hashmi'ini es koileich. Do you want to know when I'll listen to your tefillahs? Ki koileich arev. If you have a voice of arevus, Kol Yisrael Arevim Zeba Zeh. There's that word I in Reish Vez again. Responsibility Arevus. We're living through a time where we want our tefillahs answered. Think about what occurred since last Rosh Hashanah. It's a different world after the Harnof massacre. I landed in Eretz Yisrael from my father's yard site, and it was in the middle of the Leviyas from the Kedushim of Harnof. A winter where in different parts of Europe there was tremendous anti-Semitism. People went into their Pesach Seder thinking about Reb Gavriel Sassoon. It's a night of he got to Tolubincha, speak to your family, and he saw, he saw seven empty chairs. The Rebbein HaShalaylam says, Hashmi'ini es koileich, I will listen to your tefillahs, but here's the catch. Ki koilech arev, you better have responsibility. Kol Yisrael arevim zebazeh, we don't live in a bubble. Project Inspire, headed by Reb Chaim Samson, has redefined the word of arevus, of responsibility. You heard from all of the speakers tonight so eloquently, if we would find that one. Rabbi Say, there's so much on the line. Hashmini es koilech ki koilech arev. And by the way, perhaps the best part, or at least the part I enjoy most of the Vart, says, Heilige Radomsky Rebbe. Which of the three of us taught us this arevus, getting along, 
the best. It would be Yaakov Avinu because we know amongst the Shvatim there was Sinna and Kinna, hatred and jealousy. And at the end of the day, what does it say about the Shvatim? Yachad Shifta Yisrael. Everybody got along. Yaakov teaches us this getting along better than we learn the most from Yaakov Avinu. says the Heliger Radomsky Rebbe. What's the name of the tefillah that Avram established? What do we call that tefillah? Shachris. What do we call the name of the tefillah that Yitzchak established? Mincha. What do we call the name of the tefillah that Yaakov established? And don't answer Meiriv. Answer Arvis. Yaakov Avinu is teaching us as we approach Rosh Hashanah, Tavshin, and I involve, did you daven Tvilas Arvis? You know there's a checklist at night, I daven Shachris, I daven Mincha, I daven Meiriv, but did you daven Arvis? Might I humbly add, I'm not paskening in front of the Rav Shlita, but while the Gemara and Bracha says according to one opinion, Meiriv might be a Rishus optional, I humbly suggest while Meiriv might be optional, Arvis is a choiva. It's obligatory. Now, which person has a right on any given day not to daven tefillas arvis? Actually, if you think about Project Inspire, they're all about tefillas arvis. We know I daven shachris, mincha, and mayrev, but did I daven arvis? There's a world out there waiting for us. And the Rabbi Nishalaylam says, Hashmi'ini es kailech, I'll listen, ki kailech arev. Arvis means you show responsibility one year for another. My father often said over a misa, there are few misas you'll hear in your life like this one. From the Kapishna Tzerebbe, Zechusa Yogan Aleinu. It was in Kippur afternoon, the Lower East Side. The Kapishna Tzerebbe was walking during a break, perhaps before Mincha or after Musaf, and he's walking with a guy by the Lower East Side, Yom Kippur afternoon. He sees there's a restaurant, and in the front of the restaurant there's a glass window, and he sees that there is a Yid who is eating at the, in the front of the restaurant, Yom Kippur. The Kapishna Tzerebbe walks in and he goes over to the Yid and he says, and I quote, Gujomtif Reb Yid, un esmit appetit. Eat with a hearty appetite. When they walked out, the Gabbai said to the Kapishna Tzerebbe, Rebbe, why do you tell someone esmit appetit on Yom Kippur? Listen to what the Rebbe said. On Yom Kippur, on Yom HaKadosh, the Rabbi Nesholeilam judges us either as a mummer lahachis or a mummer l'teyavayin. Someone who sinned deliberately and maliciously or someone who sinned l'teyavayin, giving in to temptation and desire. When I walked by the restaurant and I saw him eating deliberately, I knew the Rabbi Nesholeilam was going to punish him today as a mummer lahachis. I wanted to downgrade him. I wanted him to only be punished as a less severe mumer l'teyavayin. So I walked in and I said, Gujomtif Reb Yid, un esmet apatit. This way when he now eats, not deliberately, but with a geshmak and a desire, he'll be punished as the less severe mumer l'teyavayin. Rabbi Isai, that's Tfilas Arvis. I have to tell you the truth. Sometimes when I think of the story, I wonder if I would have walked by the restaurant, what would I have said? And unfortunately, I don't think I would have said, Rabbi Esmet Apatit. But maybe after hearing the story, and maybe after learning about Project Inspire, maybe I would have. Because you got to care about everyone. Tvilas Arvis. Hashmi'i ni es kailechi kailech arev. It's all about achrayas. As I said at the convention, everybody has to make sure they have achrayas responsibility. How do you spell the word achrayas? Alef ches reish yud vav saf. Every one of those six letters tell you how to have true responsibility. Aleph is the first letter. Aleph means one. I've got to be responsible and take care of myself. The next letter is a ches. Aleph ches is ach. My brother, 
The Arava we opened up with. You take care of them? The next letter of Achrayas is a Reish. Aleph Ches Reish is Acher, someone else. You take care of the unaffiliated? The next letter of Achrayas is a Yud. Aleph Ches Reish Yud. Acharai, tell someone I'm far less luch. You could follow after me. Let them sense you the real deal, either by placing all of the honey bags and the chalas and the sweet things on people's doors. Well, let them see you mean it. In fact, Toronto is launching or has launched their triple play. Now in baseball, a triple play unassisted is a pretty big deal for those who know what that sports term meant. But I think that it's meaningless when it comes to Toronto's triple play. You know what Toronto's triple play is? And I believe that was the brainchild of Reb Chaim Samson and others. It means before you get to Shabbos, Barshas Lech Lecha, and invite them to your home for Shabbos, let them see it. Like you heard the packages and the boxes that are made. Invite them and inspire them for Rosh Hashanah. That's the first part. Invite them and inspire them for Sukkot. That's the second part. So that when it comes to Shabbos, Barshas Lech Lecha, the Shabbos project that is resounding around the world, that will be the third. That's a triple play. Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, culminating in the worldwide Shabbos project. Don't be left out of the triple play. That's Tfilas Arvis. And so the letter Aleph Ches Reish Yud means Acharai, follow after me because I'm real. What's the next letter? Aleph Ches Reish Yud Vav, Acharav. You know I'll follow after this guy. I see you're the real deal. You walk the walk, you talk the talk, you're sincere. Acharav, I'll follow you. And what's the last letter? Tough. Aleph Ches Reish Yud Vav Sof. The first letter is an Aleph, the last letter is a Tough. That's the beginning and end of the Aleph base, Aleph to Tough. Because you've got to be there for a fellow year, beginning to end. Saying that I'll be there for you because you know you're daven next to me in shul. We come from the same shtetl. You're part of my milieu. You have the same havara. That's not called achdus. That's called cloning. Truly being there, as you heard in the letter that the Rav read, the person said, if somebody would have just showed me, cared, looked for me, Aleph to Tuf, beginning to end. So they're not exactly like me. They don't have the same background. They don't yet know the beauty of Shabbos. Aleph to Tuf, and that's Achrayas. Aleph to you, Aleph Ches to your brothers. Aleph Ches Reish to Acher, everyone else. Aleph Ches Reish Yud, follow Acharai after me on the real deal. Aleph Ches Reish Yud, Vav Acharav, I will, I'm comfortable with you. Aleph to Tuf, beginning to end. That's the way to do it. I mentioned the story a little while ago with Ramesha Feinstein. There was a woman, I heard this story from the doctor himself, the, the son of the lady involved. She needed to take medicine on Pesach for her heart condition. So she, every year, Erev Pesach would call Reb Moshe and ask him, can I take the medicine? And every year, Erev Pesach, Reb Moshe would patiently explain to her why she could take the heart medicine why it wasn't chametz, why it was okay. Explain it thoroughly and wish her a good yar, a good jumtiv. Every year. This went on for over 20 years, Erev Pesach. And now Erev Pesach is a pretty busy day. It's probably the busiest day. For a rav, exponentially, it's probably, like they say, with the pressure that's just south of the near nuclear explosion in Three Mile Island about 30 years ago. And for Reb Moshe, Erev Pesach, we can't fathom. The son tells me, one year my mother had gotten a bit elderly and she forgot to call Reb Moshe. Two hours before Yontif Pesach's to begin, the phone rings in her home and she picks up. And the voice on the other end says, hello? This is Moshe Feinstein calling. I didn't hear from you today to find out about your medicine. I was concerned. Are you okay? 
When I didn't hear from you, I was worried. Are you all right? And then he went on to reassure her that she could take the medicine, it's not a problem, and again, vinched her on a good jumptif. Rabbi Isai, do we fathom that story? I know that if I would come home, perhaps I shouldn't say it publicly. And there's a phone call that I had to make, but my wife or somebody will tell me, no, they called and said, you don't need to call them, or they forgot to call you. That's like a simcha, that's enjoyable. Reb Meisha and Erev Pesach calls a woman, I didn't hear from you today. Are you all right? I was concerned. Because Reb Meisha understood, Achrayas is Aleph Ches Reish Yud Vav Sof, Aleph to Tuf beginning to end. Hashmi'ini es Kaylech Ki Kaylech Arev. You have to have a voice of responsibility. I just want to say one final thought before we go to the third definition of Ayin Reish Bez. What does it take to become this person? What does it take? My father once wondered, how could it be that the Hebrew for the word to be alive is neshama? And the Hebrew for the word to be desolate and void is neshama. One could look in the Haftar of Parshas Parah and they'll see many times that word. What? They're the same letters, nun shin mem he. Virtually identical nekudais. Neshama means to be alive, and neshama means void. Why should I get up in the morning? What's the difference between neshama and neshama? Under the shin of neshama is a patach, which looks like this. Under the shin of neshama is a kamatz. How do you make a kamatz from a patach? A patach is a line across like this. So how do you make a kamatz from a patach? You add a little support underneath. And when you add a little support, you create a neshama. Ask people who have no support. Ask people who would not know that on Purim you hear a Megillah, and on Hanukkah you light a Menorah, and on Pesach you eat matzah, and on Sukkot you take the Alminim. And what did we just hear about Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah in Disney World, Rosh Hashanah in hotels all over different European countries. When people have no support, their life is neshama. Show a little support. And you create a neshama. That's all it takes. And I think that's why we heard from a few people tonight, and as well in the name of Rabbi Noach Weinberg Zatzal, if everybody would find one neshama, we'd rewrite history. It doesn't take something big and grandiose. It doesn't take my entire city and a thousand families and a mountain that's insurmountable. The difference between neshama and neshama is a little support. If everybody would take upon themselves one yid, one family, one person, history would be rewritten tonight. Everybody has to create a neshama. After all, is that not what Rabbi Yisrael Salanter said? <speaking in Hebrew> to how many are you indispensable? When I had the privilege of writing this in an article a few months ago, I actually asked these questions, which I'll quickly ask to you. How do you do on the following checklist? To how many people are you truly indispensable? How many people can you say depend on you for chizuk? Huh? How many people count on you for Shabbos and Yontif Suda? And I don't mean when they get called Friday afternoon. How many people count on you to learn with them and teach them more about Yiddishkeit? And their children, if they or the parent aren't there. How many people count on you to help them financially and emotionally? To how many people are you a shoulder to cry on, a listening ear? Do you provide a warm smile or a kind word? And finally, how many people could you honestly say count on you for advice, guidance, inspiration, and compassion? That's a checklist. 
And the same way a person goes into Yantav with a checklist, I made this for this meal, and that for that meal, and I took the suit to the cleaners, and the car is filled with gas, and I'm ready to go. Ask yourself the checklist that I just mentioned. How many people on Rosh Hashanah are going to say, Rebina Shalaylam? Please grant her, him, a good kebench to yar. I need them. And I can't live without them. No? How many people are you indispensable? For the advice, for the guidance, for the chizuk, financially, emotionally, yomtif, Shabbos, learn with them. That's a checklist. And that's the second definition, arvis. And now for the third and final definition, perhaps the one that we most associate the ayin rejveiz with, more than arava, and more than that concept of kol yisrael arevim zebazeh, it's what I said a few moments ago, the harevna. You know how to do this? The upshot of everything we've said, really everything, the relationships with those nearest and dearest, those with, him in, with whom you have been in a fight, those unaffiliated, it's all the same answer. Tell them how sweet it is. I believe I heard in the name of our Gadol Hador of Chaim Kanievsky, Zal er gesund und stark sein. I believe I heard in his name the following question. Why is it that in Birchas HaTayro we say Vaharivna, yet we know that the Ava Rabba could also act as Birchas HaTayro if one didn't say the Birchas HaTayro, yet in the Ava Rabba, or Ava Soilum if you have Svard, there's such a long list. Maybe 10 things long. Why is that list not in the brach of the harivna? You know what Reb Chaim said? Because if you have the harivna and it's sweet, you have everything. If you have the harivna, by definition, you have the lilmoid, lilame, lishmar, velasois, only when you don't have it. Could we please leave here tonight and go into you may din tough shenai and vav showing them the harivna? There's nothing sweeter. It's that triple play I mentioned earlier, Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, and Parshas Lech Lecha. It's getting involved with Project Inspire. You don't mind if hundreds of us come to you and want to get involved tonight, I'm sure. Bombard Project Inspire more than they were ever given. I want to do, I want to do, tell them that. Vaharevna, could you please leave here tonight showing somebody how sweet it is? Our family, Mechutin, Reb Moshe Schmelzer, the Menal of Tel Chicago, has told me the following Reb Moshe story many times. I simply can't get enough of it. The first part of the story is a little bit sad, so I apologize. But uh, years and decades ago, some Bochum decided to make uh, prank phone calls. And the pranks were going to be to different poiskim, different gedolim, and fabricate silly halacha questions. One of these boys, it was his turn to call Reb Maisha. It pains me to even say this part of the story. But fasten your seatbelt and listen to the rest. He had to call Reb Maisha. He called about 11 o'clock. Reb Maisha had already gone in. The Rebetzin said, should I wake the Rosh Hashiva? And the boy who was going to play the prank said, yes. Reb Maisha came to the phone and said, hello. He said, excuse me, I have to wash my hands. Metilas yadayim and make brachis. He then asks Reb Maisha his silly prank, Shaila. Reb Maisha picked up right away that it's a joke. And so he says to this Bachar, where do you learn? The Bachar, fearing that he would be in trouble, didn't want to answer. Maybe something's going to happen to me. Rabbi Moshe reassured him, I'm not, nothing will happen, don't worry. Where do you learn? He tells him. What Gemara are you learning? He tells him. What Dafra you want? He tells him. He says, let me ask you a kasha on Toysvis. He asks it to the boy on that page. Asking that kasha on Toysus to the boy, of course the boy didn't know. You want to know the Haravna? I'll tell you the Haravna. 
I'll tell you, Vaharavna. Rav Maisha says, let's learn the Gemara. Of course, Rav Maisha, without taking the Gemara, word for word, Gemara and Rashi. Did you get it? Let's do it again. Any better? Let's do it again. I don't know if Rav Maisha taught him word for word, three times or four times, Gemara, Rashi, every single word. Now let's do Tysus. I taught him Tysus. After he instilled in the Bachar Vaharivna, look how sweet it is. He then said, now let me ask you the kasha again. And he asked it to the boy, and the boy said, you know, it's a good kasha. That's an unbelievable question. Ramesha says, here's what I want you to do. Tomorrow, I want you to go to yeshiva, and when you learn this sugya and taisvis, I want you to ask your Rebbe this kasha. The next morning he's in class and he asks the kasha. And the Rebbe says, that's an unbelievable kasha. Where'd you get it from? He says, from Reb Moshe Feinstein. The Rebbe says, I need to think about it. At the end of the week, after thinking about it for those few days, he comes back and he gives the boy an answer. The boy says, I was so empowered by the sweetness of Tyra. I was so empowered by the patience and loving guidance of Reb Maisha, that Reb Maisha had the chokhmah, a thousand psychologists might not think of it, empower the boy with a question so that the boy can go in and now all of a sudden he says to himself, my Rebbe thought about my kasha for almost a week? I, Mamish, had the power of that kasha? The boy turned his life around. And yes, I will tell you, and it's 100% accurate. Maisa shahoya kachoya. The boy today is no boy. He's a choshev, a choshev, a magid shir in a very prestigious yeshiva gedayla in the tri-state area. A prestigious yeshiva in the tri-state area, a choshev, a magid shir. You know why? Because v'harevna. He tasted the sweetness, and he tasted the patience and the guidance of Rabbi Misha, and it turned his life around. You know, Rabbi Say Chazal tell us, Adam Amal Yulad. You know how everybody translates Adam Amal Yulad? People were created Amal. What's a good definition to toil? You know how you spell Amal? Lamed, Ayin, Mem, Lamed. You know what Lamed, Ayin, Mem, Lamed really stands for? Lilmoid. Al Minas Lilamid. Rabbi Isai, we weren't created to live in our own bubble and cocoon. Adam la Om al Yulad stands for Lil Maid Al Minas Lilamid. We have to show the beauty. There's a shot from the Radomsker on the on the in, in, in Pirke Yavois. You know everybody translates that? If you learned a lot of Torah, don't pat yourself on the back and think you're a gift to the world. You were created to learn. You know what the Radomsker says? Anytime you have the word Toiv, Toiv is Torah. If you're privileged to learn a lot of Torah, don't keep all that goodness for yourself. Don't be selfish. Al tachzik toiva. Don't keep the beauty of Yiddishkeit la'atzmecha. Ki lakach natsarta. You were created to spread it. In fact, if you rearrange the letters of the word natsarta, it spells the word sinairis. Sinairis is a pipe. Pipe it into another yid. Tell me something. Is there a better definition in the world for Project Inspire than that? I'm sure many people will say there is. I humbly think that was it. Tell me something. You know in a few days is Rosh Hashanah. Do you know millions don't? Do you know many think there's nothing wrong with eating onion kipper? What are you talking about? Going into a what are you going to that hut for on Sukkot? Menaira, Megillah, what's wrong with bread on Pesach? Al Tachazik Toiva Don't keep that goodness and beauty for yourself. You were created to spread it. 
And that's the way we began tonight's talk. We're looking for judgment on Rosh Hashanah. Says Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, Ki ha'yechida liskais badinhi. Let's say those words again. The single greatest piece of advice to be meritorious in judgment is, Lihiyos ish tzerabim tzrichem loi. Become indispensable to as many as you can. To the arava, to those nearest and dearest, to people that you need to make amends tonight. Kol Yisrael Arevim Zebazeh. Achrayis, Alephes, Reish Yud Vav Sav. And what does it take? Neshama, just a little bit of support. After we've tackled the arava and we realized I start with those nearest and dearest. Then I realize Hashmini as Kailech Ki Kailech Arev. I have to have a voice of responsibility. The third definition is the one we mentioned, Vaharevna. It's so sweet. It's so sweet. And the sweetness turns lives around. When people will get serious about the triple play of Project Inspire. When people will get serious about the Shabbos project, that which is used around the world, and so many, including Project Inspire, help to promote. The Harev now show them the sweetness. And that's a way to make sure we're indispensable to people. I just want to end with one Misa. There was a couple that worked for Leiv La'achim, the Kirov organization, in, in the northern part of Eretz Yisrael, they, had, they did fabulous work. They had a boy who just turned three. In fact, when I said this over recently, someone who knows the family extremely well added in a very, very, very sad detail. Their three-year-old who had had the upsharing in the morning went to Cheder, and as the day progressed, he wasn't feeling well. And after he went to lie down in Cheder, unfortunately, the three-year-old was Nifter. And this couple that worked for Leiv Laachim had to now sit Shiva for their three-year-old. Someone who knows the family very well said, in Eretz Yisrael, they say that in the morning, on the way to the upshare, and they wrapped their three-year-old in a talus, and at night, by Kura, they also wrapped their three-year-old in a talus. By that they mean, many have the custom that in the morning, by an upsharon, you wrap in a talus so the eyes don't see anything that's not pure. And they're sitting shiva. Sometimes people in a shiva home don't say the brightest things. And that was being kind. The man who's sitting shiva for his three-year-old gets a phone call. He comes back and this is what he says. I am currently trying to be Makar of eight boys that don't keep Shabbat. One of the eight just called, representing the other seven, and said to me, the rabbi, we heard what happened to your three-year-old. In his memory, I and the other seven, the eight of us, this Shabbat will keep one Shabbos. This Shabbos for your three-year-old. He comes back very moved and he shares this with everybody. And someone who did not say something very bright, probably meant no harm, but still, he says to the rabbi, the phone call was nice from the eight boys. Like, is it such a big deal? They'll keep this one Shabbos and that's it. You know, who says they're gonna keep Shabbos again? One Shabbos and they're gonna keep Shabbos again? It's nice, but not that lasting or meaningful. It's one Shabbos. Our friend looks at this man and he says, I'll answer your question. You want to know if it's meaningful that they'll keep one Shabbos? Do you know what my wife and I would do, he says, to get our three-year-old back for one Shabbos? Do you know what we would do so I could feel him holding my hand again, bringing him back from Shul Shabbos Day? Or for my wife to see that he'd be bouncing on my knee while we sing Zmirais? 
You know what we would do to get him back for one Shabbos? You want to know if it's a big deal? We would give up everything to have him back for one Shabbos. And then he turns to the man and says, Now the Rebina Shalilam is getting eight children for one Shabbos. Eight of his children back for one Shabbat. You still want to know if it's a big deal? Ask my wife. The Rebina Shalilam is getting back eight children for one Shabbos. That's a big deal. And so through the triple play and approaching the Shabbos project, maybe the Rebina Shalilam will get back hundreds of thousands for one Shabbos. It's a big deal. In fact, it's the biggest deal to take into Rosh Hashanah, period. Let's be Zaycha. This is the month, as the Rav said, of Elul, Anila Daidi Vidaidi Li. But if you spell those letters backwards, Aleph Lamed Vav Lamed, spell it backwards, it's Lamed Vav Lamed Aleph. You know what that spells? Lule. You know what Lule means in English? Lule, if only. Lule, if only. You know who says that? People who live with regret. If only I would have done that sooner. If only I would have called him. If only I wouldn't have said that to her. If only I would have listened to the speech. There are some people who live their entire life Lule-esque in nature. They live with regret. If only I would have done this. If only I would have taken it serious. Don't let this month end as Lule. A month where we regret, I didn't. Some people live their whole life that way. As this month comes to an end, we better make sure that it's not the month of Lule, but it's the month of Elul. Anila Daidi, Vidaidi Li. May it be the will of the Rebina Shalaylam that because we came together tonight on behalf of Project Inspire, and we will make sure, number one, the first I in Reish Vez is the Arava, I will care for those nearest and dearest. The second I in Reish Vez is Kol Yisrael Arevim Zebazeh. I have to show responsibility. And the last I in Reish Vez is Vaharivna. How sweet it is. Let's take that schus into Yom Hadin. That's a big deal. Let's take what Rabbi Yisrael Salanter says to heart. You want to be meritorious in judgment? Become someone that you are indispensable to people that they will in shul say, I need that person. And in that schus, that the rabbim need us. Our families need us. Our neighbors and co-workers need us. The unaffiliated need us. May it be the will of the Rebina Shalalem that we never experience lule, but elo. And in that schus, may the Rebina Shalalem grant every one of us, because we are so indispensable and needed because of the chizuk we provide to others, may we be zaychet to have a ksiva v'chasima toiva, a gebench to gezunta yor, and a year filled, filled with only Yiddish nachas to be enjoyed gezunta hate. Thank you very much, Rabbi Shapiro. In conclusion, everybody had a sheet on their chair. So please take a look. We have a Shabbat, so a very practical thing to give Shabbos to somebody else. Tishrei triple play. I just want to end with a quick thought before you leave. So when we walk out of here tonight, Let's commit to do something to help our neighbor, our friend. Let's take an action. And before Shabbos, let's make sure that we're going into Rosh Hashanah with this incredible schus. And you know, we get asked oftentimes that why should we do Kirov? Why should we care about Kirov, donate to Kirov, do anything about Kirov? We have so many issues ourselves that we have to take care of. All right? We have Shiduchim. We have, we have every last issue under the book. There's a project for everything. Why care about Kirov? And I think we heard the answer here tonight loud and clear from Rabbi Lowy and Rabbi Shapiro that the reason is that if we take care of Hashem's children, then Hashem will take care of us to be as chos for Shaduchim, Parnasa, for Yeshua, for everything we need. And if we're able to daven for Hashiveinu Hashem Eilecha Venashuva, then Taka will be Zaycha for Vikabe Tsnidacheinu Meyarba Kanfei Saaretz.
Chaverim kol Yisrael, every single Jew, v'noi mar, amen. We're going to have Marv now on this side of the Mechitza. Thank you so much. You could give your pledge cards to the volunteers. And when we be zeiche badin, call to.